Welcome. This is Dr. Gary Salton, Chief of R&D and Creator of IOP Technology. This video reports on evidence-based research on women in engineering. The U.S. Census Bureau tells us that engineering has the lowest female participation rate in the STEM occupations. You know, science, technology, engineering, and math. In fact, female engineers have half the participation rate of females in the exact sciences. The exact sciences use the same quantity of measures, precise predictions, and rigorous methods as does engineering. So, females with the same biochemistry, same role demands, and same skill sets are systematically favoring science over engineering. Why? We decided to see if this condition was local to a particular area of engineering. So, we sorted the National Science Foundation list of 154 STEM occupations by level of female participation, lowest to highest. We then colored the engineering jobs in yellow and the exact sciences in blue. The results are clear. Female engineers cluster at the lowest levels, while female exact scientists spread out over the range of participation levels. This kind of clustering is no accident. It's pretty solid evidence that something systematic is going on in engineering that is not happening in science. And a literature review produces a host of reasons for this condition. Take your pick. They are probably all right to some degree, but the clustering tells us that there is probably a common denominator, and the IOPT information processing model may help identify it. To one degree or another, information transfer must be involved in the clustering phenomena. If you want to learn more about IOPT, this eight-minute video will orient you to how it works. But for now, let's jump into the data. The IOP database contains information on 2,855 working engineers and 619 scientists, and it gives us the tools to analyze this data. So, let's start with styles. IOP defines styles as unique combinations of input-output elections. Styles control the initial response to a situation and produce predictable patterns of behavior. Three different measurements involving styles are relevant to our analysis. The first is style strength. This measures the level of commitment. It tells how tenaciously a person will hold to a style in the face of opposition. The more tenaciously a position is held, the more likely it is that that posture will be seen as inherent to a person or group. The frequency of behavioral display is the next measure and it is set by the rank order of a style. The higher the rank of a style, the more likely it is that that style will be displayed in interaction, and the more likely it is to be seen as part of the embedded personality of a person or group. Finally, not every issue yields to the same style response. When a particular style is inappropriate, people shift to the next style on their rank order list. The rank order list is relatively stable, and its orderly sequence produces predictable behavior patterns. These sequences are termed strategic patterns and describe long-term tendencies since they happen over multiple situations. So, let's use these measures to compare the females in science and engineering. In terms of style strength, you know, tenacity. Female engineers are 9% more committed to the LP style than are their science counterparts. This style focuses on certainty of outcome that is achieved by relying on proven methods exactly executed. The difference is not large, and there are five chances out of 100 that it is due to random variation. Frequency, you know, the rank order of style use, magnifies the difference. Female engineers are 21% more likely than female scientists to use the exacting LP strategy. Once again, there are five chances out of 100 that this is due to random variation. But there is no ambiguity in long-term behavior. Female engineers and scientists are virtually identical. None of the differences even approach statistical significance. So, 
The difference between female engineers and scientists are real, but only at the marginal 5% level of significance, and their long-run behaviors are virtually indistinguishable. So, why do so many of these roughly similar people choose science over engineering? Well, the place to start looking may be with the dominant male majority. They are the ones setting up the environment. If they are the cause of low participation, we should find male scientists and engineers to be different kinds of people. In style strength, male engineers are about 10% more committed to the analytical HA style, while male scientists use the idea-oriented RI style with about 13% more fervor. This is a noticeable difference, and there is only a one in a thousand chance that it is due to random variation. Frequency magnifies strength differences. Male engineers are 33% more inclined to use the analytical HA as their initial response, while scientists are 87% more likely to use the idea-oriented RI style as their backup strategy. Again, there is only a one in a thousand chance that this is just random variation. And these differences extend to long-term behavioral postures. Both engineers and scientists put primary reliance on the conservators' established methods rigorously applied. But male engineers are likely to persist with 11% more tenacity. When the conservator position is not applicable, male engineers move to the perfecter strategy. Untested options are considered, but are validated using rigorous analysis. Caution, skepticism, thoroughness, and an intense focus on accuracy are the characteristic cultural qualities that follow from this election. Like the engineers, male scientists also start with a cautious, exacting conservator stance. Also like engineers, scientists seek out new ideas and options. But these new ideas are validated using experiment rather than analysis. Experiments are less organizationally demanding than is analysis. Trying out new ideas rather than analyzing them is called a changer strategy. And this little difference has organizational implications. Male scientists and engineers ultimately get to the same level of certainty. But scientists do it with a greater risk of failure. Since most experiments fail, this failure has less consequence. This makes accepting a wider range of ideas and options cheaper. And, since experimental validation is less intellectually expensive, the cost is reduced still further. A primary focus on the size of potential gains, rather than on certainty or efficiency, still further reduces the cost to the scientist. Finally, Open, free, and transparent communication is encouraged as a way of getting more ideas and limiting their associated uncertainty. The net effect, relative to engineering, is the creation of a civil, casual, and flexible environment. Engineers live in a different world. Stuff has to work the first time and every time. They accomplish this using rigorous standards focused on minimizing risk. The result is a cautious stance in accepting new ideas. They get the assurance they need using in-depth analysis, an intellectually expensive and demanding strategy. The intellectual costs are compounded by the added requirements of efficiency and effectiveness. In a world where any analytical misstep can result in embarrassing criticism and other unfavorable outcomes, restricted and reserved communication tends to become the cultural norm. For the engineer, mistakes have more consequence than they do for the scientist. The net effect is a relatively civil but somewhat rigid environment, characterized by a somewhat severe tone and a degree of underlying tension. At this point, it's not hard to figure out why more qualified women choose science over engineering. Simply Googling female role responsibilities produces 102 million references. The content in these citations varies, but the fact that gender-based role expectations exist is beyond question. The more flexible environment of science 
makes it much easier for females to balance their role responsibilities between work and home. Effectively, science can make use of a broader range of information processing styles because of the nature of the work being done. We can see this more directly by comparing the male-female profiles in science and engineering. The coefficient of determination, r squared, numerically confirms the visually obvious. R squared is a goodness of fit statistic that in this case measures how well the female style profile matches that of the male. Female engineers have a relatively tight fit with their male counterparts at about 83%, while female scientists register a relatively weak fit at 24%. In other words, Female engineers are more like their male counterparts than our female scientists. These numbers tell us that women are able to prosper in science by making a very different kind of contribution than their male counterpart. Comparing the profiles of the 520 working female engineers with the 2335 males in more detail might give us a little more insight into exactly what is going on. In style strength, the genders differ by only about 10% in two dimensions. But those two dimensions are mutually exclusive and hard to reconcile. The female's secondary preference for the proven, well-understood methods of the LP style automatically foreclose the male's secondary RI preference for new, untested options, tenaciously sticking to a position that is contrary to the other gender's preference is bound to generate some durable tensions. And behavioral frequency magnifies the tensions of style strength by providing a continuing reminder of the gender differences. It is on these kinds of reminders that stereotypes are built. Long-term behavioral patterns solidify the tensions generated in shorter-term interactions. Male and female engineers differ on all four long-run IOP patterns at high levels of statistical significance. So, short-run interactions give visible evidence of differences that are hostile to male interests, and long-run interactions confirm the judgment that those differences are a fundamental quality of the other gender. Now the search begins for a cause or reason. The result is the formation of a stereotype which then goes on to govern things like promotions, performance standards, and other such environmental factors. These are the factors that then appear on the gender-based list of grievances, which in turn leads to an engineering participation rate half of what is realized in the exact sciences. This is the same process that creates the engineering personality. That personality is a permanent condition governed by the structure of engineering work and the kinds of people needed to do the job. But low female participation need not be a permanent component of it. But we don't want to kill the golden goose. Engineering protocols give us airplanes that fly, skyscrapers that stay standing, and appliances that work when we flip the switch. We want to improve the environment for females without compromising the engineering standards that create these products. So, what's to be done? Well, continuing to encourage females to pursue science and math is baseline. The bigger the pool of capable females, the more we'll end up in engineering. Attracting women with greater relational innovator, or RI capacity, is also worth pursuit. A greater proportion of inherently creative females lowers the gap with the male profile. Stereotypes are based on visible differences. The smaller the differences, the less viable are stereotypic prejudgments. Still another area that might be addressed is the compensation structure. Current compensation programs assume that both genders place the same value on the same things. But, Differing role responsibilities can cause females to value wage benefit trade-offs differently than do males. Allowing people to allocate both base wage and benefits to an overall compensation number can make engineering a more attractive option. The greater the proportion of women lured into engineering, the more favorable will be the gender environment. The physical environment also matters. Highly interactive environments, such as those typical in open office arrangements, 
create opportunities for casual offensive banter, inappropriate attributions, and other gender hostile behaviors. Providing engineers with offices or partitioned areas can go far toward limiting the opportunity for destructive behaviors. And it is likely to be appreciated by all involved, male and female. Howard Gandalot, a high-level organizational consultant with degrees in chemical and metallurgical engineering, may have the most promising strategy. He has used IOP technology to address team and gender issues in both corporate and classroom settings for over 20 years. Howard's basic approach is to show how different IOP styles can be leveraged to everyone's benefits, male and female. Basically, he changes a negative bias into a positive one. And it's not a hard sell. Engineers almost instantly see the value of IOP's engineering-based tools that are backed up by quantitative evidence of their applicability and effectiveness. The key to successful initiatives will be to alter the engineering structure while preserving those portions of the culture responsible for the advances that we all enjoy. If done in a manner that benefits all involved, a positive change in the psychology of individuals will automatically follow. There is a tipping point somewhere between the current participation rate and full equity. Cross that point and the factors discouraging female participation will simply disappear. In final analysis, actually realizing increased female participation is the permanent solution for the gender inequities in the engineering environment. Thank you for viewing this video. If you would like to learn more about IOP technology, please visit our websites at IOP.com or OEinstitute.org. Both sites have much more information on IOP and the areas where it has or can be applied. Thank you again for your interest in IOP technology.